Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space Updates. I'm Sean Deville, joined as always by Blaine Curcio. In this episode, we discuss the growing importance of rideshare launches in China. But first, let's talk about three future rocket concepts that China is planning for crewed spaceflight over the next 20 years. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So this week we got a glimpse at the rocket technology that China is developing for the next 20 to 30 years. A couple of days ago on February the 17th was held in Beijing the International Symposium on Cooperation on Near-Earth Orbit Human Spaceflight, and this was organized by the Chinese Society of Astronautics and the IAF. While the conference in its entirety was rather interesting, there was one presentation that stood out in particular. It was the one that was on China's future launch technology for crewed spaceflight, and this was by Wang Xiaojun, who's the director of the Chinese Academy of Launch Technology, also known as CALT. And this is basically China's largest state-owned launch company. And so basically, as a quick recap, China's crewed spaceflight program today is reliant on three types of rockets. You have the Long March 2F, which is a very old but also very reliable rocket, which flew for the first time in 1999, and which is based on engine technologies, which are 30 to 40 years old. And it is in charge of launching the Shenzhou crewed spacecraft, shuttling Taikonauts to and from the Chinese space station. Next, we have the Long March 7, which is a new generation rocket using more modern Carolox field rockets, and it sends uh, you know, supplies to the Chinese space station by launching the Tianzhou cargo spacecraft. And finally, you have the much heavier heavy lift Long March 5B, which is in charge of putting into orbit the much larger pieces of space hardware like the Tianhe core module, which was sent to orbit last year, but also the Mengtian and Wentian experimental modules, which are scheduled for launch later this year. But as we know, China's future crewed missions are going to expand massively in the coming decades, going beyond the Chinese space station potentially, and mirroring to some extent what is going on in the US. It's, for example, developed the much more massive crewed capsule that's temporarily named the NGCV, the next generation crewed vehicle, and of which a prototype flew for the first time in 2020. As sort of a Chinese equivalent of the Orion spacecraft, this um, spacecraft will be able to shuttle up to seven Taikonauts to low Earth orbit, as opposed to three Taikonauts at the moment for the Shenzhou spacecraft. And it's also designed to enable deep space exploration, meaning that it could be used also for lunar missions, as well as potentially other deep space missions. And this bad boy will weigh anything between 14 to 23 tons, which is way beyond the current payload capacity of China's current human rated rocket, the Long March 2F, which is limited to 8.2 tons into LEO. And this brings us back to Wang Xiaojun's presentation with the introduction of China's first future rocket, sometimes called either the Long March 5 DY or the 9 to 1 rocket. And this is a human-rated rocket using existing Chinese hardware, such as the Carolox fueled YF-100 engines, which are already, for example, used on the Long March 7, but it will be used on a much larger scale. And it will also be available in two versions. You'll have a plain two-stage version carrying 14 tons to LEO. And again, this is a significant improvement over the Long March 2F currently, which is able to put only 8.2 tons into low Earth orbit. And there will also be a three-stage version with two side boosters that will be able to put 27 tons into lunar transfer orbit. And as you can see on this picture here, this is a human rated rocket with an escape tower that's able to pull Taikonauts away from danger in case of an emergency. And it is likely also that this rocket will have an increased number of redundancies, just like on the Long March 2F. And so all of this is nice and makes sense, but we had already heard of this from the chief designer of the Long March rockets, Long Le Hao, in June 2021. So the real scoop of this presentation from last week comes from the way the Chinese plan to reuse the first stage. Apparently, the early stages of deceleration are going to be aerodynamic, and they're also going to employ you know, a landing burn like the Falcon 9, so this is fairly familiar. But the actual landing, you know, the final stages of the landing, will not be done with landing legs. Apparently, it's going to be using a tethered recovery system where the stage would basically be caught by a net, and thanks also to a number of hooks. And so beyond this rocket, the Long March 5 DY, China has also been investigating two additional concepts. 
The first one is a starship-like concept. And through this concept, I think it's really impressive to observe the influence that SpaceX and Elon Musk continue to have on the Chinese space ecosystem. And I think a really good example of that is how we see many Chinese rocket companies having you know, gone for similar solutions today to the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. And here we're seeing Cal, the Chinese Academy of Launch Technology, considering a starship-like two-stage rocket. And this rocket would be powered by um, liquid methane and liquid oxygen. And the second stage would perform aerodynamic deceleration at various angles of attack, depending, of course, on the speed. And this includes horizontal deceleration with a pitch angle of zero degrees, again, very familiar to Starship. And this is before performing a belly flop and landing vertically, again, similar to Starship. And so that's for the second stage. Uh, the first stage, however, would land vertically in rather a more classical way. And also we know from separate renders that were released last year that this rocket, this sort of Chinese starship, appears to also go for an aluminum type alloy for its structure. I mean, you know, again, similar to Starship. It will also be using Methlox engines, you know, the Chinese Academy of Launch Technology, having identified liquid methane as really the ideal type of fuel for reusable rockets. And just one last point on this rocket, it would be a bit of a stretch to say that this is a Starship clone because there are some differences. And for example, Cal seems to be going for you know, a smaller version that would only be able to put 20 tons into LEO as opposed to the 150 tons payload capacity to LEO that I believe Starship has in the US. And apparently, you know, the Chinese rocket will be focusing more on cargo missions as opposed to potentially other missions such as Earth to Earth space travel on the, you know, on the side of Starship or acting as a lunar lander, again, in the case of Starship. And apparently we also know that the Chinese Starship will seemingly be using a more simple methalox fueled engine. It will be using a gas generator cycle and not a full flow stage combustion cycle like the Raptor engine of Starship. And finally, China's third rocket concept for future crewed spaceflight is a two-stage vertical takeoff, horizontal landing sort of a space plane rocket dedicated to sending Taikonauts to the Chinese space station. And this concept actually matches pretty well with past Chinese space plane tests. And for example, the Chinese Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASC, tested a space plane second stage in 2020, which was launched on board a Long March 2F. And they also tested a first stage space plane, which took off vertically in the summer of 2021. And so both of these um, space plane tests match pretty well with the description of Wang Xiaojun's um, you know, space plane rocket during this conference that took place over the past week. And more generally, I just want to add that China is probably one of the rare and one of the last countries possibly in the world that still puts a lot of hopes into the space plane concept technology. They've repeatedly shown space planes on their roadmap. And today there are at the very least three or four space plane projects that are currently going on in China. So I mentioned CASC, but you also have CASC's arc rival company, CASIC, which stands for the Chinese Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. They also have uh, been investing massively in this technology. They are, for example, developing the Tungyun space plane, which has two stages and where both stages land and take off horizontally. And apparently they're also developing associated technologies such as combined cycle engines. And finally, I want to add that there are also some commercial companies that are developing space plane technology. I have notably two that come to mind. There's iSpace that's planning to develop a suborbital second stage space plane, as well as an orbital second stage space plane further down the road. And perhaps even more impressively, you have another startup that's called Space Transportation or Ling Kong Tianxing, and that's really going all in on space planes. They're notably developing a space plane for Earth to Earth space travel that's human rated. And so overall, in a nutshell, this conference in Beijing was really interesting, despite the fact that you know the information that was being shared was already known for most of it. I think a point to note is that the reiteration of some of these concepts mentioned here today, such as the Starship-like architecture, or also the, you know, the two-stage space plane, this suggests that the Chinese are really serious about developing these rockets, at least to a prototype level. And so we should expect to see some of these you know, rockets, again, as a prototype, I, I would guess in a 10 to 15 year um, time frame, and probably even closer than that for the Long March 5 DY, that would probably be a time frame of, you know, in the next five years. So Blaine, that's uh, a lot on some very futuristic rocket concepts. You want to take us to another interesting trend in the Chinese launch ecosystem, which is rideshare. Thanks, John. Moving on to a different launch vehicle and our second piece of news of the week, we saw earlier in the week a Long March 8 emerge onto the launch pad at the Wanchang Space Launch Center in Hainan province in the southern part of China. 
in preparation for a launch that is expected to take place tomorrow morning, the 27th of February. And so probably by the time this video is published, that launch will have been completed. And one of the biggest talking points about this upcoming launch is the number of satellites that are going to be launched on the rocket. So namely 22. And this would be a record for a Chinese rocket with the previous record of 20 satellites having been set by a Long March 6 launched in 2015. And for those who have been following the global space sector for just the last few years, this 22 number might seem a little bit pedestrian compared to what we've seen from uh, notably companies like SpaceX, which are now launching you know, 60 Starlink satellites at a time fairly routinely, uh, and also occasionally launching you know, more than 100 satellites if those satellites are smaller than the Starlink satellites. And so really just, um, it's easy to forget with this you know, incredible increase in launch cadence um, that up until not that long ago, these very you know, dozens of satellites on a single rocket type of launches uh, were very uncommon. And so probably the, the classic example would be the original Iridium constellation, uh, which launched in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And this Iridium constellation launched a maximum of seven satellites per rocket, but over the course of 95 satellites that were deployed, it was done over 22 launches. So we're looking at an average of about four satellites per rocket. Now, granted, these Iridium satellites are pretty big. They were about 700 kilograms. Uh, but nonetheless, at the time, you know, seven satellites on a single rocket was, was quite notable. And I think, again, looking at the last several years, we've seen this really large step change where we now see quite some dozens of satellites being launched on specific rockets. And indeed, we see this ride share business model of, you know, not just a company like Iridium saying, we're going to book a bunch of rockets and, and build a bunch of standardized satellites to launch on those rockets, but really, you know, rockets that are saying we have, you know, 10,000 kilograms of launch capacity. And whether your satellite is 10 kilograms or you know, 10,000 kilograms, we will try to accommodate that. And as this has occurred, we've seen uh, primarily in the Western space sector, a number of different companies emerge that are kind of middle people for these, you know, between the rocket companies and the small satellite manufacturers. And so typically this would include companies like ExoLaunch, which is a company that uh, bulk purchases launch capacity and then adds some, you know, does some value added service of integrating a bunch of small satellites and, and selling those different launch spaces to different small satellite manufacturers. And we've also seen companies like NanoRacks that's doing a similar thing, but also doing a bit more of, you know, deploying satellites in space from uh, sometimes areas as exotic as the International Space Station. And so then if we move over to China, the commercial rideshare market in China up to this point is not nearly as mature. And really, I mean, at this point, the closest thing that China has to a, uh, let's say, a, a launch uh, rideshare service provider would be a company like China Great Wall Industry Corporation or CGWIC. And for those who follow the show, you would know that CGWIC, they wear many different hats, but most of those hats involve being the commercial subsidiary of CASC, China Aerospace Science Technology Corporation, the country's largest state-owned space contractor. And so in this role, CGWIC, they, again, do many things international business, including selling large geostationary satellites, which are kind of the more traditional uh, launch business that I referred to earlier, um, but also increasingly doing business with commercial space companies, both outside of China and notably inside of China, where you have a crazy number of commercial satellite manufacturers, many of whom are interested in finding, you know, uh, capacity to get to orbit. And I think CGWIC's role, it really was crystallized uh, towards the end of last year at the Zhuhai Air Show, which took place in September and October of 2021. And at the Zhuhai Air Show, we saw a flurry of contracts signed between CGWIC and China's various commercial satellite manufacturers, with many of these contracts being for rideshare missions, and indeed with many of the rideshare contracts being for uh, spots on this upcoming launch tomorrow. And so getting into this launch tomorrow, getting into the 22 satellites that are going to be on this rocket, um, we see a pretty diverse variety of, of players. So we see about nine satellites being launched by CGSTL for their GLIN constellation, as well as multiple satellites from commercial satellite manufacturer MinoSpace, as well as satellites for Spacity and Wuhan University and Ada Space, among others. And the implication is that we've seen in a period of roughly five months, CGWIC and CASC and then these commercial companies coordinating what is a you know, very difficult thing to coordinate, you know, how to fit 22 satellites onto a single rocket, how to, to make sure that they're all um, compatible with one another, and basically how to make sure that the chances of failure are exceptionally low, even when the complexity of the mission is quite high.
And I think moving forward, we're going to see more such Long March 8 rideshare missions. I think it's becoming more routine. And indeed, an article published earlier this week by Kelt did mention that small satellites on rideshares are going to become the norm. And I think as well, moving forward, we will see these commercial launch companies, your Land Spaces, iSpaces, One Spaces, uh, Galactic Energy, trying to offer this rideshare service. And I think one of the questions to, to ask when looking at this is, you know, how are they going to do that? I mean, we've seen them occasionally going directly to customers. We've also seen companies like Galactic Energy partnering with Huatang International, which is kind of to Kasich, what CGWIC is to Kask. So Huatang being kind of this commercial subsidiary of Kasich. And so really, I think overall, we're seeing just this large increase in launch capacity in China with many of these rockets being big enough to put several tons into orbit. And frankly, with not that many several ton satellites being planned by China. And so almost by definition, you're going to see a lot of relatively small satellites being put onto relatively big rockets. And as I mentioned earlier, in the West, this has led to a whole value chain. You have companies that are doing many different services in this process of you know, fitting a 10 kilogram satellite onto a rocket with 10,000 kilograms of launch capacity and making sure that that 10 kilogram satellite has just as high a likelihood of, of you know, successful deployment as would a much larger satellite. So again, really, I think moving forward, this is going to be a very important topic to watch in the Chinese space sector, this rideshare concept. And so clearly, you know, pretty diverse variety of, of plans for, for what's going into orbit from China over the next few years. And we see a large number of rockets coming down the pipeline. And so I think there's really going to be a lot of rideshare going on moving forward. And uh, Jean, any thoughts from you on, uh, on rideshare or indeed on this upcoming Long March 8 launch, which we expect just under 24 hours from now? Yeah, and, and all of this reminds me of a launch that took place um, last year in August 2021, it was of a Long March 2C, and I remember seeing that that rocket had been adapted with new wider fairings, and it also included this sort of tube-shaped multi-satellite adapter structure to enable uh, multi-satellite deployment. I think So I think that's also an interesting point to note that CASC is looking... You know, not only to do multi-satellite launch and ride shares with uh, their newer generation rockets, the Long March 6 to the Long March 8, but also potentially with the older generation rockets like the Long March 2 to the Long March 4. And so I think that's a wrap up for this week's episode. I just want to say a special thanks to Hua Tuo, Frankie Chung, SCD Mio, as well as to anonymous patrons who have all gone over to buymeacoffee.com slash Dongfang Hour to make sure that at the Dongfang Hour, we always have you know, sufficient coffee. And as usual, a special shout out to spacewatch.global and GoTikonauts, two excellent sources of space industry news. And with that, thank you very much for watching and we will see you in next week's episode.